bless your word today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, it's time. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Once again, I welcome you to Riverside Tabernacle. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Simon James. And it's my honor to share God's word with you this morning. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. And I pray that you will be receptive to the voice of the Holy Spirit as God speaks to the churches. That is why the Bible says, let he that hath a year, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and we thank you, Lord, that we can bow in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day and the wonderful rain that is falling outside. We thank you, Lord, that you give us good things in its due season. And we thank you, Lord, that you send your rain on the just and the unjust. For your providence is impartial. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we pray this morning, Lord, even as we speak your word, we pray that it will not be me that speaks, but it will be you. And I pray, Lord, for every home, wherever your children are watching this morning, and even in the future, that the Spirit of God will clear the atmosphere and will change the atmosphere to an atmosphere of miracles, to an atmosphere of conviction, of change, of holiness. Bless us as we consider your word this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. And once again, welcome. And to today we're going to be speaking about something that's very close to many people's hearts. It's a question that many people have asked. Many people have asked these questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? And our scripture reading is taken in two parts today. I have one which is the verse which I want to call the beginning and one verse which I want to call at the end. And the first verse is Romans 8.28 which says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then the last verse I want to read is Philippians 1 6, which says, And I am sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So why do bad things happen to good people? When things go bad, we ask ourselves, what did I do wrong? Why is God putting me through this? Doesn't he care about me? We sometimes ask ourselves the questions, am I saved? And many a minister, even a pastor or a evangelist would, would, or a teacher of the word would, would agree with me that there are times when even they question, am I saved? And then we say, I wish I were dead. Why are other people doing well and I am suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? And then Satan adds in his lot. He tries to be helpful and he says, God doesn't love you. Look at how happy the sinners are. They don't have problems. He says, if Jesus loves you, why are you suffering? Give up. Try another way. Try another God. There's no God. There's no God, Jehovah. Don't waste your time with Jesus. That is Satan's words that he speaks to us many a time. But I want you to understand today that every true Christian, every true believer undergoes trials. Even those who are apparently doing well. There are many people that you look at them and you see they don't have, seem to have any problems. But I can tell you, if they are close to God and they love God and they are called according to his purpose and they're working in that purpose, they will undergo trials. And don't let the devil entice you away from Jesus. Many times other ways seem very easy. They seem so much better. They seem so much more rewarding. Don't let an apparent goodness entice you away from what is fundamentally good. Satan will entice you from Jesus. He will offer you your best life now. But when you die, you will find it's the worst of times in hell. Let me tell you something about Satan. I know him quite well. Misery loves company. And that just about sums up Satan's character. 
Misery loves company, and he's trying to go to hell with as many people as he can take. So why does a loving God allow such things as death of a child or a loved one? Why does he allow disease and injury, hardships, worry, fear, torment? Why does he allow this to children who are his, his own children who are really believing in him they got faith in him why does he love it surely he would keep trouble away doesn't loving us mean that he will make life easy for us no 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 i'm sorry to tell you it doesn't every father knows this that there are times you have to discipline your child sometimes you have to make a child do something extraordinary something more difficult than he's ever done before why you are building his character you're building his strength you're building his resilience you're preparing him for the future the christian life does not mean that we are immune to trials and tribulation it is not a vaccination or an immunization against trials and tribulations faith makes things possible not easy Faith makes things possible, not easy. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. Important. The Bible clearly teaches all things together for good for us. That's Romans 8.28, paraphrased. Trials and tribulation are part of the Christian walk implying that they must have a divine purpose and we'll explore that today today we will examine this question why do bad things happen to good people so join me as we try to understand god's purpose in allowing us to undergo trouble pain and disappointment the first thing i want to talk to you about is the adamic judgment the judgment of adam Suffering was never God's intention in the first place. He created a perfect, peaceful, and pain-free world. The Bible says, and God saw that it was good. If Satan hadn't interfered, it would still be so. Because of a desire to be like God, Adam and Eve had a desire, or had a desire for the forbidden fruit. And God held Adam accountable and their punishment became our inheritance. Sin brought shame and shame invoked pride. Let me explain this. When, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they realized they were naked. Before that, it was no problem. They felt shame. Shame is a result of pride. If they hadn't had pride, if pride hadn't entered their lives, they wouldn't have felt shame. So shame and pride go hand in hand. And through sin, they brought shame. And through shame, pride. And pride is a major cause of our problems. This is the reason we don't submit to authority or we don't uh, uh, submit to the authority of God. We don't submit to God's way uh, and will. Ego, our ego ourself gets in the way of submission and pride can lead to all kinds of sin the adamic curse imposed suffering and physical death and our glorified body started to decay remember when we were in the garden of eden or when adam and eve were there their bodies were glorified they were not supposed to die but because of the curse because of sin our bodies started to decay Eve's quest for independence brought marital discord and it even has it even nowadays you see it. Eve had this desire to be like Adam. She wanted to do the things that Adam was supposed to do. God has created a family with headship. Adam is the head. Man, you are the head of your home, whether you like it or not. Whether your wife is a strong character or not, you are the head of the home. That is how God made it. That is how it was in Eden. But Eve had this desire to decide for Adam. And we even find that now that many women would not submit to a godly husband. They would not, or, or to the godly model 
of a family. And the godly model of a family says, states that the man is the head. And this has led to women being called to submit to their own husbands in the New Testament. You find Peter and Paul and other writers call women to submit. James also calls them to submit to their husbands. And sometimes it says to their own husbands. Why? Why? Because Eve had this desire to be like Adam. She had this desire to be above Adam. It was her pride. And this was what caused her to take the fruit and eat it because she felt I can make the same decision as Adam. Let me tell you that the family model of God is different and you need to follow it. The man is the head. The woman is the helper. The desire to take Adam's place led to what we call now the feminist movement. Sin sentenced man to, life, to a lifetime of hard labor. Sin sentenced us to a lifetime of hard labor. Everything we do is not easy. It's difficult. And God said to men, by the sweat of your brow, you will cultivate the ground. The simple act or the apparent simple act of eating the forbidden fruit, plucking a fruit from a tree, eating it, became a major sin of rebellion against God. It was a major sin of rebellion. That sin started in Eve's mind as a desire to be better than her husband, to be like her husband, to be better than her husband, to make decisions for her family and to take over the role of the man. Disobeying God's instruction was a rejection of his love and sovereignty. We said to God, you have no sovereign right over us anymore. We want to be our own master. Man wanted to be his own master. Adam and Eve decided they will be their own master of, and they'll be the master of their own destiny. Pride may have won the day, but suffering entered into humanity. Rain is impartial. I call it impartial rain. Right now we're having rain where I live. And when you look outside, the rain is falling everywhere. It's not only falling on certain homes. It's falling on all the place here, on everybody. And the Matthew 5, 45 says, God sends rain on the just and the unjust. God's creation is for everyone, regardless of whether one believes in him or not. Everyone benefits from the rain that God sends. In the same way, and occurrences and incidents can, can and do happen to anybody without bias. Sickness and death affect us all. So do other calamities. Good and bad are all affected in the same way. Being a child of God does not mean you have immunity from problems, as I've said before. During the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this was made abundantly clear as even believers in Jesus prayed over still because it does not mean that we have immunity from sickness and from sorrow and from pain and from suffering. However, we have somebody that we can go to. We have a God and his name is Jesus and we can go to him for comfort. In fact, you will face more problems because of your faith. Remember Job in the Bible? He was a righteous man by God's own admission. Yet he suffered as if he were a sinner being punished by the hand of God. But more of that later. It is not that God cannot keep you from, free from pain. But pain has a reason. Now I want you to imagine a life without pain. A pain-free life. You wouldn't know when you're unwell, when your heart is about to stop or you have a congestion in one of your arteries, you'll feel no pain. You won't know that you are dying. You see, God has made discomfort and pain as a motivator. Pain is a motivator. Pain is a mover. Sickness strikes Christians just as it strikes others. Why would God allow this? Why would the Christian God allow his children? If he's a true God, why would he allow them to go through that? He's not 
healing the children's bread according to the Bible? You see, it's for your testimony and for the glory of God. God can use your sickness. God can use your pain for his glory. These are some of the reasons why God allows pain. When God heals you, he gets the glory. Because you testify about it. Secondly, how will you be able to relate to someone in pain if you cannot understand their pain? If you have never had sickness in your life, you will not understand or truly understand how the sick person is feeling. If you have not gone through a difficult relationship, you will not be able to counsel people adequately who have a difficult relationship. If you do not understand drugs or you hadn't, have never had a son or a daughter who was in drugs, you will find it difficult to empathize with somebody who is going through that problem. And that is what God did. He allows our, us to go through this so we can learn, we can understand and we can utilize our understanding for the furtherance of his kingdom. Everyone faces death as well. And I look at the reason for death later on. I want to talk to you now about holy infusion. An infusion of holiness into the body. It's like a, transfuse, a transfusion of holiness into your body or into your soul. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says that we rejoice in our sufferings. Imagine that. We are called to rejoice in our sufferings. We are not called to complain. We are called to rejoice Rejoice, be happy, be happy when you encounter trials, the Bible says. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. Suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. When you look at this, you find there is a progression. There is a progression from the man that you are to the man or woman that God wants you to be. You have to go to sufferings to, to, in, to learn endurance. And endurance has a product called character, good character. And good character, character produces hope, hope in Christ. Is sanctification. Yes, sanctification is defined as being set apart and made holy to God. Set apart and made holy to God. Sanctification. Pain and suffering bring the soul closer to God. Pain and suffering bring the soul closer to God. It forces one onto one's knees. If you didn't have that suffering, you may never go on your knees and pray to God. But God forces you through suffering to get onto your knees. It humbles the soul and brings your soul into submission to God Almighty. It humbles the soul. It teaches you humility. It teaches you submission. Many a person would never kneel before God if they were not bent by the heavy load they carry. That's something that I got yesterday in my mind. Many a person would never kneel before God if they were not bent by the heavy load they carry. Discomfort is a great motivator. It moves one to action. Trouble creates a closer dependence on God. When you have trouble, you depend closer and you depend more on the Lord. A deeper relationship is cultivated between you and God. And you have a better testimony. Without trouble, the soul may walk right past the cross into hell. Without trouble, we may never pause at the cross of Jesus Christ. Experiencing suffering that brings, experiencing the suffering that sin brings is a deterrent against repetition of those same sins. Because sin brings suffering and we experience that suffering, it becomes a deterrent to us. Trials keep us true and make us holy and keep us apart, set us apart for God. Trials and tribulation identify the weaknesses in our life, the areas in our life where we feel weak, where we need development. Adversity keeps us humble, loyal and reliant on God. 
We rely more on God during trials and then we learn to walk in obedience. When we do not have trials, we walk away from God. When we have trials, we look to God. That is a purpose, another purpose of trials. It helps us to walk in obedience to God. It develops the fruits of the Spirit in us. Long-suffering, perseverance, patience. Read Galatians 5, you'll see. There are many fruits of the Spirit, love, charity. They are developed when you rely on God. The Lord uses trouble to bring you to holiness. Let's look at an example. The Lord used trouble in the lives of the Israelites. In the Old Testament, you'll find the Israelites were a very rebellious nation. They were hyper rebellious. They were ungrateful. When they sinned, they rejected God's presence. And they sinned when everything was going good. When everything was fine, they sinned. They went after women from other uh, nations. They offered sacrifices. They even offered their own children in the fires of Molech. And then God brought trouble upon them. God developed, he rose, he raised up people or kings of other nations, enemy nations, to come and destroy these people, take them into captivity for years and years until they came back into his presence. When trouble came, they came back into God's presence. They started to worship God again. And then when things went smooth, when God relented and blessed them, they forgot God again. Sometimes God allows troubles because we forget him when we are being blessed. Another thing that God has given us which causes a lot of problems is freedom to choose. And freedom to choose brings a lot of problems onto us. We are made in the image and likeness of God according to the Bible, according to God's own words. Part of this design that God has designed us with is free will. We can choose to live in or out of God's will. God never forces his will on us. We get to decide whether we live by his will without his will living outside his will opens up us opens us up to the wages of sin which you know is death that is what happened with Adam and Eve if they had not sinned they wouldn't have been paid by death the Adams or the Adam family that's Adam and Eve chose death over life they had eternal life but they chose death we also do that when we walk away from God. When you walk away from God, you are choosing death. It is not a simple matter for I'm sinning, I'm just doing something wrong. You are choosing death over eternal life. You are choosing hell over heaven. You are choosing Satan over Jesus. Before we ask ourselves, why do bad things happen to good people? We must ask the following questions. One, are we truly good? Two, in whose eyes and by whose yardstick? Are we truly good? In whose eyes and by whose yardstick? In other words, by whose measure do we consider ourselves good? Our measure or God's measure? Mark 10, 18 talks about God's measure. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good. No one is good except God alone. Okay. Now, before you say, oh, then Jesus wasn't good. Let me explain this to you. Jesus in this, in this, in the sentence was telling them that he is God. Many people tell you Jesus never claimed he was God. Here's one of the places that Jesus claims he was God. You are calling me good because you recognize that I am God. No one is good except God alone. Now, Jesus's words preclude that we are good. It means that we are not good. We can never be good. We can get close, but we are never good. So our question, why do bad things happen to good people, now lacks validity. Do you follow me? We now, that our question now is no more valid. We bring many of our problems upon ourselves. James 4 says that we have, we have wrong desires and wrong motives. And in doing so, we bring problems on ourselves. 
So we might consider ourselves good, good, but we're not really good. Think about it, we're not really good. But God still loves us. And God is trying to get us closer to good by allowing problems, because problems shape you. The clay on the potter's wheel is never happy when it is pushed and prodded. When it is broken down into a lump and started again, it doesn't like it. It's the same with us. But eventually, God will perfect us. And that's why I said, I know that God will perfect us and keep us till the last day when Jesus comes. We must not seek satisfaction outside of God's will. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This tells us today that the heart is inclined to sin, again telling us that we are not inherently good and that we inherited this heart disease or this disease from the heart of the heart or this diseased heart from Adam. So the heart is inclined to sin. That is true heart, heart disease. And, we are de and it is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it brings us into problems because it always wants to stray from God's will. You know, Paul says, that which I want to do, I cannot do. And that uh, which I don't want to do, I find myself doing. What did he mean? It is, a, it is the flesh fighting the spirit. It is a battle within. Freedom of choice is, a danger, is as dangerous as it is fulfilling. Freedom of choice or free will is as dangerous as it is fulfilling. God in his wisdom gave us free will. He had to do that or he would not have been true in making us according to his image and his likeness. If God made us without free will, then we wouldn't be in his image. We wouldn't be in his likeness. But like a loaded gun, freedom of choice can be good or bad. Wrong judgment because of the freedom to choose also brings us or brings problems onto us and brings us into problems. Uh, now let's take Noah. Noah was a good man. The Bible says that God found Noah righteous. Out of all the people on earth at that time, estimated to be maybe one billion, that's some, as some people estimate that, Noah was the only righteous man. But he shamed himself. He uncovered and exposed himself in his tent. And his son saw him. Why? Because he didn't know when to stop. He relied on his own judgment to when he had to know when he had imbibed his limit. He was drinking. For those of you who don't remember, he was drinking wine. He was the first winter. He made wine and he drank the wine. Or maybe he wasn't the first. They might have done it before the flood. Yes, they were eating and drinking. Sorry about that. But he relied on his own judgment to tell him when to stop. And his judgment was, was wrong. And what happened? He imbibed too much, got drunk, exposed himself, and brought shame upon himself and his family. Trouble in your life can be a test of faith. Joseph was a good man. He was a very good young man. Yet bad things happened to him. Let's look at it. He told his brothers his divine dreams. God had given him dreams. He told his brothers his dreams. He ended up in slavery. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. He ended up in the house of Potiphar. He avoided adultery with Potiphar's wife and he ended up in prison. Imagine that. Every time he tried to do something good, something bad happened to him. But in the end, God gave him victory. You see, God was testing his faith. And every time he was tested, he came through. He came through. When he was thrown into the pit, he believed God. He ended up in slavery. He sh a normal person would have said, oh, I'm gone from the frying pan into the fire. Lord, you made it even worse. No, God blessed him in Potiphar's house. Then the, devils, the devil entered Potiphar's wife and she tried to give him forbidden fruit. He refused that and he ended up in prison. But in prison, God had favor on him and he came out of the prison. And he became the prime minister of Egypt. And I believe he was the first prime minister of Egypt. They didn't, they didn't have that function before. Job was a good man. I told you I'll come back to it. Job was a good man. Yet God allowed Satan to torment him. 
It was God's confidence in Job that started the trouble. Do you know that? God started Job's trouble. God's confidence in Job caused him God said to Satan, have you thought about my servant Job? In other words, look at Job. I have confidence in him. He will never, ever give up the faith. And the devil said, allow me. And God allowed him. But in the end, God blessed him more than he imagined. Read the book of Job. Read the first two chapters and read the last two chapters. Last uh, two chapters. That's more than enough. And you will see how much God had blessed him. Many good people right now, as we speak, are being persecuted for the faith. A pastor and I were talking yesterday about the number of countries in this world that are persecuting people. Our conclusion is that there's over 50 countries right now that are actively persecuting people of the Christian faith. But despite the persecution, the gospel of God is flourishing. China, for example, is experiencing a revival in the face of government persecution. The government of China, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, are paying people that are worshipping God. And yet, every day in China, thousands are coming to know the Lord. That's a test of their faith. Untested faith is unknown faith. And unknown faith is unreliable faith. Proven faith is known faith. And proven faith is reliable faith. A person of faith is approved by God. Trials build faith, perseverance and endurance. Trials build godly character. That's why we have these trials. They identify our weaknesses, as, as I said, and God develops these, develops these areas through trials and our weaknesses become our strengths. Trials prepare us for the greater trials ahead. A soldier has to be trained. When, you, when a soldier is recruited, he's not given a uniform, an army, uh, sorry, a, a gun and sent into battle. He's trained for a particular specific period of time doing specific things. There are specific goals that he has to pass. And if he doesn't pass that, he's discharged. But if he passes that, he goes into battle. That is how it is with God. God prepares us for the trials ahead, which we don't even know about. God disciplines and humbles us. Ill discipline and pride destroy good character. The Bible says, be careful how you stand lest you fall. You're ill-disciplined. You're proud. You think you're doing very well. And then all of a sudden, sin enters and you've, you've fallen down. You may have lost your first love and God is trying to bring you back. 2 Corinthians 1, 5-7 talks about we sharing in the sufferings of Christ. To share in God's glory, into Jesus' glory, in Jesus' glory, we must share in his suffering also so we can help others in similar predicaments as he did. What am I saying? God allows us to suffer. Like I said before, if you have not been through a particular problem, you will never understand how to help somebody else. But ultimately, we are victorious. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. Someone said this anonymous. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. To polish something, you have to apply friction. There has to be a loss and a gain. It is part of the process of sanctification to be set apart and made holy. Faith is made sure or proven by trials. Rejoicing in suffering is the hallmark of strong faith. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And now I have a little saying that I want of my own. What a knife being sharpened loses of itself, it gains in sharpness from the stone. What a knife being sharpened loses of itself to the stone, it gains in sharpness from the stone. No loss, no gain. Losses make us resilient. Winning makes us stronger. God has given us keys to be victorious, keys to be overcomers. 
And I'll go quickly to them. We have the spiritual armor in Ephesians 6. We have spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. We have the name of Jesus. We have his blood. We have his word. We have the Holy Spirit. We have prayer. We have the word of our testimony. And we have his authority to overcome anything. Even death is a victory. I told you there is a purpose in death. Death is a victory to us. Death does not have victory, but death is a victory to us. It is the ultimate healing. When a person is sick and suffering in pain and they die, we mourn them and we say, but why God? But you know, that is ultimate healing because it gives them a new glorified body. They are now no more in that earthly body decaying here. They are gone. No more sorrow, no more suffering. When a Christian dies, they cease to suffer pain. And it's also God's way to take us home. God sometimes uses, often uses sickness to take us home. Now, how can that be a bad thing? We need to relook at these things. We need to change our mindset over suffering. We need to start thinking like Paul and Peter and the others thought. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Now this is a benefit, huge benefit in suffering to be given, to be given a crown of glory in heaven. Despite trials and tribulations, we have the victory. But thanks be to God, the Bible says, who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Satan has no authority over a believer in Christ. If a believer is in Jesus Christ, Satan has no authority. But that's not to say I'm a Christian in word, in name, that, I, that Satan has no authority over me. Some of us even belong to him. I'm talking about a Christian who walks in, in, the, in the way of authority over you. Great earthly trials give great heavenly rewards. There is a purpose to your life. Look at it. As if you are not suffering, but enduring. Don't look at suffering as, oh, I'm suffering, but look at it as enduring, as training. Soldiers hate training, but they need it, or they will not be victorious. I just want to talk about a little story of perseverance and somebody who would never give up. And it's a story that some of you, you might know. It's the inspiring life of Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders or Colonel Harlan Sanders was born in 1890. At six years old, his father passed away, leaving him to cook and care for his siblings. He had a mother, but she had to all she had to work, so he had to do the cooking and the cleaning and taking care of the younger children. He dropped out of school and left home to work as a farm hand. At the age of 16, he faked his age so he could enlist in the U.S. Army. After a year, he was discharged honorably and he got hired by a lawyer. Sorry, he got hired by a railway as a laborer. While he was at the railway, he was studying law. However, he got fired for fighting with another worker. So he went into the law business. He tried his hand there. There again, he got involved in the fight and they fired him. Forced to move back home with his mother, he got a job selling life insurance and he got fired there for being insubordinate to his boss. But he wouldn't give up. He carried on. He persevered. In 1920, he started a ferry boat company. And after a while, he saw an opportunity to manufacture lamps. So he sold his business and started a company to manufacture lamps. Unfortunately for him, he soon found out that there was another company making lamps, the same lamps, but a cheaper price and a better quality or a better version. So that business went down the tubes. At 40, he began selling chicken dishes in a service station. He knew how to prepare chicken. That's something Colonel Harlan Sanders knew. So he was selling his chicken dishes in a service station. But this too didn't work out because some he had a problem with advertising with somebody else. He advertised for the chicken. Somebody didn't like it. And he and that guy had a shootout. So he had to close his business down. Four years later, this man, still persevering, bought a motel with a small restaurant and he started KFC. It didn't take long. This motel and restaurant burned down to the ground. But this man was determined. 
Colonel Sanders was determined. He rebuilt and ran a new motel and restaurant until World War II forced him to close. Another problem, he closed again. After the war, he tried to franchise his restaurant. His re recipe was rejected 1,009 times. He went to 1,009 different people, different companies with his fantastic recipe, but they rejected him. Then somebody accepted him, accepted it at last, and Kentucky Fried Chicken started. It quickly became a hit. However, his restaurant had to close because a new highway opened nearby and was going to go through that place. So he, he, his business went down. So he sold it and he started trying uh, to spread the KFC franchise. He started selling the franchise around the country. After years of failures and misfortunes, he finally hit it big. KFC expanded internationally and he sold the company for $2 million at that time. In, in, in recent money, it'll be about 20 million. And his face on their logo symbolizes delicious country fried chicken. Every one of us knows KFC. KFC is one of those most recognizable signs in the world. He died at 90, but this business he started is still going on. Today, there are 23,000 KFC outlets in 140 countries. Even when bad things are happening, perseverance pays. Don't give up. Don't give up. When you die as a Christian, if you have lived for Jesus, you're not going to leave behind 23,000 KFC outlets in 140 countries. You're going to get one place, one crown in heaven. Why do bad things happen to good people? Let us conclude. Being on a spiritual path does not prevent you from facing the darkness, but it teaches you how to use the darkness as a tool to grow. Every step forward reveals a new obstacle, a new trial, and also a new strength. Every step higher encounters a greater challenge, a greater enemy, but also a greater victory. The last step you take is when you stand before the Lord and receive your crown. Ross Pirro says, most people, he's, he's a motivational speaker, he says, most people give up just when they're about to achieve success. They quit on the one yard line. They give up at the last minute of the game, one foot from a winning touchdown. The Christian walk is the same. It isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to be exhausting, or it would not be worth the reward. I trust you have found this message has helped you today and made you more determined to face your trials and not shrink away from them. Look at your trials as a time of training, not just a time of difficulty. Always keep in mind that when you stand in front of Jesus, your troubles will be behind you. If you have found this message enjoyable, I encourage you to share it with friends and community. Our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle, is up and running again. Please subscribe and share. We're looking for a thousand subscribers. Remember to join us again on Wednesday at 7 p.m. live on Facebook. I'm Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless you.